Today I want to talk about something that's been on my mind for a while and it's a hotly debated topic within the fitness and rehab world and that is, is anterior pelvic tilt a problem? You're going to see a lot of different opinions on the topic of anterior pelvic tilt and whether it's problematic. Some people believe that it is the root cause of all evil and pain and other people believe that there is no possible way anterior pelvic tilt could ever be related to any issue in the body whatsoever. And usually with two extremist viewpoints, the answer is oftentimes in the middle. And that's what I want to talk about today. Anterior pelvic tilt is considered a postural deviation. And that just means that the pelvis is in a more forward position than it usually is. We should have around 30 degrees of lumbar extension in the normal, whatever that means, human spine. But if you are more forward than that, you have more lumbar extension, that is usually considered anterior pelvic tilt. There's a wide body of evidence that suggests that posture isn't necessarily correlated with any type of specific pain. And that's something I can get on board with and very much believe in. And the overwhelming majority of people do have some degree of anterior pelvic tilt. So if it was correlated with pain directly, then a lot of people would be in pain and have back pain. Because what that anterior pelvic tilt tends to do is it compresses the lumbar spine, shortens muscles in the back and the vertebrae. But so many people present with a lot of anterior pelvic tilt and have no issues whatsoever. Why can that be? You see, pain is complex. It's biopsychosocial in nature, which means that people have pain for all sorts of different reasons. You could have pain because you're in a bad mood, because your friend or partner has pain and that's making you feel bad, or you can have pain for strictly biomechanical reasons like what we just discussed, or a combination of all three. So there isn't one reason why someone is going to be in pain. But some of you who are more frequent watchers of my channel may say, well, Connor, then why is it that a lot of your content has to do with getting people out of anterior pelvic tilt? I would say it's not the anterior pelvic tilt that we're worried about. It's the resultant movement limitations that happen on a systemic level that is related to a lot of extension tone in the body. If someone doesn't have a lot of red flags with an injury history or a chronic back pain that's gone but it might come back or something along those lines, then I'm generally going to be okay not trying to fix something that's not broken. However, there are certain outcomes that happen when you do have a lot of anterior pelvic tilt that can affect the body on a systemic level and restrict movement options and lead to movement compensations, which over time can lead to undesired wear and tear on certain structures and tissues. Let me break it down for you. I view anterior pelvic tilt as someone trying to manage their center of mass under gravity. If we don't have the ability to move through the gait cycle and put force into the ground, then we're going to point our hip sockets down at the ground and push our center of mass forward, which gives us better leverage to do that. But the consequences are is that as this spine curve increases, something has to compensate or else we would literally just fall forward. So a lot of the times what happens is that our rib cage is going to be pushed down and forward, which gives us that idea of thoracic kyphosis or very rounded shoulders, but it's really just us trying to balance ourselves out so we can keep an even line going down our body. A lot of postures are the result of trying to accomplish this strategy. The more extension you have in your body and the more compressed and downwardly oriented your rib cage is, the less you're going to be able to rotate. So try this. Try to sit or stand with a lot of extension like this, flare your ribs, cross your hands across yourself, and then try to rotate from side to side, maintaining that big rib flare. It feels really bad. But if you were to keep your ribs down more so, and then stand with your weight more evenly distributed amongst your foot, or if you're sitting, feel your sit bones firmly on that chair, keep your ribs down without losing any height in your skeleton, and then try rotating. It's much more fluid. And that's because we have a better ability to stack our rib cage on our pelvis and we're not just shoved into extension tone, which is going to limit our genuine ability to rotate. Initially with the pelvis, when it moves into this anterior pelvic tilt orientation, the femurs are going to be pushed into an internally rotated position relative to where they were before. 
you can see how this is going to orient the femur back in the hip socket more. Now that is going to limit our ability to create external rotation because the femur won't be able to slide forward in the hip socket as well. External rotation is important for a lot of different things. Generally, external rotation is paired with absorbing force and also moving through the gait cycle, going from heel strike to mid stance. Squatting deep requires a lot of external rotation. There are a lot of different things that it requires, but that's going to now be more limited than it was before in an anterior pelvic tilt. If we don't have the ability to move through our femurs and move through hip flexion and extension because we're jammed within the hip socket, then we're going to primarily move through orientation of the pelvis. A perfect example of this would be a squat, a deep body weight squat, or even a loaded squat. As we descend into a squat, we enter more and more internal rotation, but then at the bottom portion of a squat, we actually need to move back into external rotation. Let's say that we have a forward pelvis and we can't do that very well. Well, what we're gonna do is as we get into more and more hip flexion, we're going to run out of room for the femur to rotate within the hip socket. So what's gonna happen is we still have to find external rotation if we wanna go any lower. So what we usually do is round the whole back and orient the pelvis under us, which is a classic butt wink. And that's going to mimic us going into more hip flexion but really all it is is the pelvis rotating underneath itself and posteriorly orienting to find external rotation or mimic that instead of getting that genuine movement through the femur. Again, not necessarily inherently problematic, but over time for some people that could lead to undesired wear and tear of structures and tissues. But if we have a lot of anterior pelvic tilt, what tends to happen is that the pelvis is now so forward that we are now very internally rotated within our femurs in the hip socket. So now internal rotation is going to be limited because we are already in a position of a lot of internal rotation. And there is a general idea in biomechanics that you can't move somewhere you're trying to get if you're already there. So if you're already in a lot of internal rotation, it's gonna be hard for you to present with more internal rotation. Now there are several studies that show that there isn't a strong correlation between hip mobility and low back pain, except for a loss of hip internal rotation is the strongest correlated thing with low back pain and even other types of pain within the body. This is interesting because we know, based off of what we just talked about, the more forward your pelvis goes, the more you're going to lose internal rotation. So it's not necessarily just the anterior pelvic tilt. It could be that, for some people, that the resultant loss of range of motion and movement options that happens as a result of the position of the pelvis could over time lead to issues. And this is where my approach is more centered. So when I see someone that has pain and anterior pelvic tilt, I'm not thinking about the anterior pelvic tilt. I'm thinking about how that's going to limit their movement. And depending on what kind of a person they are, what sorts of tasks they need to do, is that going to be potentially problematic? If you want more information and solutions, and exercise videos that can help with this, then you can check out the article I'm writing alongside this video, which I'll be linking in the description below. It will have a lot more information, visuals, and exercises that will help for this. And therefore, I don't care about fixing anterior pelvic tilt. I care about restoring movement variability and the ability to genuinely move through these positions of internal and external rotation, hip extension, hip flexion, without driving a ton of movement through the low back as a compensation. So if you want to help restore your movement variability and potentially also get your pelvis in more of a neutral position, then what we want to do is improve our stacking. Stacking refers to the ability to get the pelvis, rib cage, and head in a neutral position. This is neutrality, and neutrality is not an end destination. It is a starting point to allow us to move into all these different joint actions that may be necessary. 